which I'm lucky to introduce only one, and his name is easy to pronounce, uh, Dustin Modi. <laughs> right? Uh, so D Dustin actually, uh, he uh, came to NIST about a year uh, before I did, and then when I left uh, back to Louisville to live with my wife again, uh, he took over this uh, uh, PQ Crypto project, so he's, he's kind of the lead, the project lead. Uh, so any any blame blaming anything goes directly to him, uh, uh, but he's been super super valuable actually for keeping me in the loop. Uh, he's usually my interface with everybody else in the group, and uh, he's become an expert in basically everything and the legal matters. He talks to the lawyers. He uh, he's he's really amazing, really amazing. But anyway, uh, let, let's welcome him for his presentation. More about the PQC project. Daniel said, yep, he was in charge and then he decided to move, so he got me up here. I'd like to thank PQ Crypto as well for giving us uh, NIST the opportunity to have a talk this morning. Back when we had to pick how many days we were going to have for our workshop, we didn't know how many submissions we had received, and so we guessed, well, we'll probably need about two days. And then when we got over uh, 80 submissions and, and 60 or so that were accepted, we started trying to figure out how are we going to put them all into two days and we realized it was not going to be easy and PQ Crypto gave us a couple hours this afternoon and gave us a talk this morning to make it a little bit easier and give us a little bit more time so we're, we're thankful for that. Um, I titled this talk, Let's Get Ready to Rumble, so you might think that has to do with the fact that we're starting a, a competition between a lot of schemes, but actually it's because over the next two days NIST isn't providing any food so your stomachs are going to be the things that are rumbling. Um, Actually, Microsoft was kind enough to sponsor one break, so there will be one break with food. But. So I don't think I need to go into a, a very long background or anything. I think we're all aware of the, how research in quantum computing is progressing fairly rapidly. We heard a, a good talk from Microsoft yesterday that outlined a lot of the, the progress that they've been making. And in, if you've looked in the media at all, you've seen other companies like Intel, Google, and IBM. They've all been able to produce um, qubits at a, at a larger number than they have in the past and that will likely continue. So we know the impact as well of course that with large scale quantum computers that there will also be an impact in cryptography. And at NIST our role there is to create crypto standards for the federal government and that are all, also used in many other places as well. So we have crypto standards for public key cryptography, symmetric key cryptography, and a lot of the other tools and, and guidance that we need to give along with that. So specifically the ones that we're most concerned about with regards to public key cryptography, uh, we have FIPS 186, the digital signature standard. It has DSA signatures, RSA signatures, ECDSA. Uh, then we have a few other special publications that deal with key establishment, things like Diffie-Hellman and using RSA for key transport. And because those would be the ones that would be broken by a quantum computer, then those are the ones that we're primarily focused on with our standardization effort that we're undergoing right, right now. So those are the reason why we wanted those primitives first and foremost before we looked at any other applications. Obviously there will be an impact as well with the other crypto that gets used. So for symmetric key, we, we know that like for AES, we'll likely need to use longer keys for hash functions we'll probably need to use a, a longer output and we'll, we'll have some guidance on that at the future is, as uh, that becomes necessary but primarily the public key aspect is where we needed to get started earlier than anywhere else. So, uh, NIST has been looking at post-quantum crypto for a while. Um, back in 2009 Ray and a, another colleague of ours at NIST, David, published a survey paper that kind of outlined how things were way back then. Um, our project started ramping up a little bit more around 2012 where we, are, we started putting more and more members onto this project and we started holding more regular meetings and we'd have bi-weekly presentations where we'd be keeping up with the research. Um, we'd invite experts from around the world to come in and, and talk to us. Um, right now we have around 12 people who are spending a good amount of time on the, the post-quantum crypto project. We'd love to get a few more if, if, the, if there are people that are interested in coming to NIST. Um, you can talk to us about that. 
And we're active. We're actively following all the research. We're we're doing our own research. We're going around and presenting at workshops. We're we're publishing in journals and everything. We're working with the other standards organizations, and I'll have another slide about that, um, because we know that we can't do everything at NIST, and we need to work with everyone else. Um, in April of 2015, we held our first workshop, and there was a good amount of interest back then. There was around 150 people who attended that from government, academia, and industry, and it was very successful and helped keep momentum building in this field. And all, all along the way as we were having our meetings and looking at this, the question in the back of our minds, of course, was, well, do we need to start taking concrete steps towards standardization? And what would, what would be prompting us to need to do that? So the question that obviously frames that debate is, when will we have a large-scale quantum computer? And at NIST, we have scientists who are working on many different things. Um, but we ourselves in the crypto group, we're not building quantum computers, so we're just following the research just like everybody else. And at our workshop, Mike Mosca was brave enough to give a concrete estimate. And since then, we've heard other people give similar s sorts of estimates that in anywhere from 10 to 15 years, there would be a chance that quantum computers could be built. Um, he also started talking about his, his theorem that we've seen a lot that helps you understand the need to start preparing before a quantum computer to get standards done and to get implementations done so that by the time a quantum computer comes, you're, you can be well prepared. And our experience at NIST as well has shown us that it takes a long time to develop good standards and to get them used and, and deployed in products around the world. Uh, if you look at ECC, for example, the first papers were in 1985 where the idea was, was published. Uh, the first standard was 15 years later in 2000, and it wasn't until several years after that that ECC started being more widely used in products. So standards and deployment takes a long time. And you can speed that up a little bit, but it just naturally has to run its course. Um, things kept progressing after our workshop and, and other workshops that were occurring along with a lot of research. Uh, the NSA made a public statement in August of 2015, and that was pretty unusual because the NSA often doesn't make public statements. And, and it got a lot of people's attention when they mentioned that they were looking at uh, their transition to quantum resistant algorithms. Um, shortly after that, NIST published our own report on post quantum crypto. It was a short little report that's pretty easy to read and it, it outlined our perspective on things and it, it also gave kind of our initial plan towards standardization. And later that same month at PQ Crypto in Japan, we gave a presentation where we announced that we would be launching this. Uh, the standardization effort in post-quantum crypto that we're, we're currently in the middle, or not the middle, at the beginning stages of. And we, we very much want to see our role as managing a process of, a, of achieving community consensus in a timely and a transparent manner. That's been our goal from the, the start, and we want to continue to keep that as our goal. And we don't expect to pick one winner out of this. Uh, there's not going to be just one post-quantum algorithm that is the winner, and that's what we will use for everything. Uh, it'll likely be that we need to choose a few different algorithms for signatures, a few different algorithms for encryption and so forth to fit different applications and because each algorithm has their, their advantages and disadvantages. And if we can end up coming up with some selections that might not be everybody's top choice but they meet everybody's minimal uh, kind of requirements and we're able to achieve some consensus, then I think that would be a, a winning effort. So our timeline, uh, after we announced the the uh, standardization effort that we were doing. Uh, we published some draft submission requirements and evaluation criteria, and we got a lot of good feedback from various people about that. So we took that and we made some revisions. We, we followed most of the suggestions that we received, and then we, we published that in December. And that gave people about a year to fine tune their submissions that they hopefully had been starting to work on with the deadline of November 30th of last year. So. Uh, the deadline passed, we got a large number of submissions, um, and here we are at the first NIST PQC workshop where all the presenters over the next couple of days will have the opportunity to, to come and present their submissions that they turned in. Um, we'll have our second workshop in August of 2019. It'll most likely be co-located with crypto. We're, we're working out the final details, but that's, that's for planning purposes when you can probably expect that to be. And sometime between now and that second workshop, 
will make a, a cut to the number of algorithms um, to a smaller number that we hope people will focus on those. And we're not sure of the exact timing or, or so on, but it'll be some time between the workshop right now and, and the second workshop that we'll, we'll have. Uh, after the second workshop, it'll be another year, maybe two years of, of evaluation and analysis. And at that point, we may feel confident enough that we can select some schemes um, for, for putting in a standard, or we may feel we need to have one more round. So we're not committing yet to exactly what we'll do. We, we need to see um, where all the research takes us up to that point. And it will probably take another year or two to write the standards and, and so forth. So it'll probably be another four to six years before we estimate that we can have um, a standard ready for post-quantum cryptography coming from NIST. Uh, along the way, we will release reports and, and explain our rationale so that people know what we're thinking and, and why we make any decisions that we do. So most of you are probably are already familiar with uh, kind of the, the call that we put out, but I just want to kind of go over some of the basics of it since we're going to be hearing all the submissions and um, it helps to remember what they're targeting and, and how they'll be evaluated. So the scope, it comes from, again, replacing the the standards that we have that will be broken in, in public key. So we wanted digital signatures, uh, encryption, and key establishment. Things like Diffie-Hellman that you can put in, in the CHEM framework. So in many ways, this is very much like some of the competitions NIST has done in the past. But on the other hand, we haven't come right out and just called it just a competition. We're aware that everyone calls it a competition, and we call it that ourselves. But there are a few differences that we always want to point out and make people aware. Um, in some of the ways that it's different than the, the AES and the SHA-3 competitions that we've done in the past. And one of the first of these is just that this field is a whole lot more complex than what we've had to deal with before. When we were looking at hash functions, there was a good amount of research and there was a lot of commonalities that people were able to build on. And with post-quantum crypto, we've got widely different mathematical frameworks that we're basing submissions on and we're looking at more than one primitive at once, and we're dealing with quantum computers and not just classical computers. So there's just a whole lot going on that we didn't have to deal with before. And looking at this emissions, there's no silver bullet that is among any of these. Each scheme has its advantages, and it usually has some disadvantages as well. Um, so there's just a lot of complexity and uncertainty involved with the whole process. They said before, we also don't expect to have just one winner. With the SHA-3 competition, KCHAC was selected. It was what we standardized, and none of the other hash functions we expect to standardize. Uh, with post-quantum, we expect there to be a small number of algorithms that we include in our standard, and it very likely could happen that there could be another post-quantum standard a few years after our initial one that includes other schemes as well. Our goal with this project is just to be able to get a standard with post-quantum algorithms in place so that we have something to use um, sooner than later. Uh, we'll also narrow our focus at some point. Um, that, that's somewhat similar to what we did before, um, where we cut down the number of alg algorithms to focus on. But the difference is that, as I said, if your scheme isn't selected to move on, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're kind of kicked out of the competition, as it, as it happened with uh, our other ones. And we also are not guaranteeing that our evaluation criteria and our requirements are going to stay fixed or our timeline. We're, we're being very clear that this is all subject to possible change if there's research and, and evaluation analysis that goes on that indicates to us that we need to do so. So just talking a little bit more about some of the other complexities that we're all working with. Um, we've got three different primitives to focus on, um, and they, they take a different skill set sometimes. We're dealing with both classical computers and quantum computers. Um, that's a new, new area for many people working in this field. And part of the difficulty is always choosing concrete parameter sizes to provide a, a certain level of security and being able to quantify that in some way. And that's especially difficult with quantum computers. Um, we, do, we don't have as much experience in, in how to define security in that way. So there's also new uh, security models and practical attacks that we have to take into account. Um, side channel analysis is improving. Uh, with a lot of these post-quantum schemes, there's a lot of different parameters involved in setting up the system, so there's multiple trade-offs that could be made. So 
it's not as easy, easy to necessarily fine tune things and you can you can improve your key size by maybe adding in some more structure and it might hurt your performance a little bit. Um, so you have to consider exactly what, what is the best trade-offs that you want to do. And then we're going to need to be putting all these algorithms into existing applications as well as there's we're, we're sure going to be new applications as well. Um, a lot of these algorithms might not fit into the profiles that we currently have and, and things are going to have to be changed and tweaked. So that's going to be something that is going to involve a lot of effort as well. So the, select, the selection criteria that we announced that we're focusing on, number one is security. Any scheme that we choose, we need to absolutely have confidence in the security against both classical and quantum attacks. After that, performance considerations are obviously very important. Um, these are primarily dealing with performance on classical machines because that's what most of this crypto will be implemented on. And then after performance, there's just a, a range of other properties that a scheme could hope to have. And it might not necessarily have everything, but the more you have and, the, and so on, the better. So the, the more it can be a drop-in replacement to existing protocols, the better. Um, if it can provide perfect forward secrecy or resistance to side channel attacks, all these things are, are certainly very good. And we asked the submitters to kind of describe what were their advantages and, and their properties that they had. So in looking at security, um, what we put in our call for proposals, uh, we had some security definitions. We did not require security proofs with the submissions. Most of them did include some security uh, arguments, but they were not required. Uh, for encryption in CAMS, we were initially targeting CCA2 security. Um, it was suggested to us that there are some use cases for more ephemeral things, and so we also added a, a CPA security, and some schemes have targeted that. Uh, for signatures, uh, we were looking for existential and forgeability against chosen message attacks. And these are what we will be using to judge whether an attack is relevant or not. We also wanted to know what the best um, what the best attacks were against both classical computers and quantum computers, what is the asymptotic complexity, as well as what are the best known attacks that actually uh, happen in practice. Um, and we, we really needed people to give as best as they could a precise claim of security against quantum computers. So with quantum computers, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty and we agree that so far there's not consensus is the best way to measure quantum computers. Uh, how to measure quantum attacks and to give a security level. On the other hand, when you're writing standards, we need to be able to provide concrete parameters and pr tell you how much security you're providing. So with our current crypto standards, for all the schemes, there's parameters and they tell you if you're providing 112 bits or 128 bits. And we need to be able to do the same thing for the, the post-quantum crypto standard that we're working on. Uh, there's, there's always going to be uncertainties. There's new attacks that could be discovered both with classical attacks or with quantum attacks, um, especially because quantum algorithms is still a very active field of research. And there's just, we don't know what quantum computers are actually going to be like because they haven't been built yet. So we don't know their true cost, their true performance. And that make, makes it very difficult to be able to accurately set parameters based upon that. But nonetheless, we need to do our best to, to provide estimates. So we set five different security levels as a way to um, try and estimate the quantum security that an algorithm was providing. And there was a good amount of discussion about this. And even internally, we weren't, we weren't completely sure this is the best way, but this is uh, what we ended up coming up with. So, Security level one, it was defined as your, your system would be in this level if it's at least as hard to break as doing a brute force key search on AES-128. And similarly, uh, levels three and five were defined with just larger key sizes for AES. And levels two and four we put in there, um, you're in there, for example, level two, if you're at least as hard to break as doing a collision search on SHA-256. So depending on how the, the best quantum attacks against your scheme work, if they're generic or if there's more tailored algorithms, you might be able to get level two or four as opposed to levels one, three, or five. Most people ended up just choosing to provide security for levels one, three, and five. Um, 
And we know that this is a hard thing to estimate. We wanted submitters to look at a variety of different metrics and we provided some guidance in our, our call for proposals as to how we were thinking about this. Uh, we wanted people to focus primarily on levels one, two, and three because we think that's enough security for the, the foreseeable future that we need to worry about, but also consider adding an option for levels four or five for very high security applications. And we understand that these are preliminary estimates that submitters were giving us. Um, but we needed a way to, to try and compare different algorithms so we would know if they're providing about the same level of security, then we could, we could look at their performance in terms of understanding that they're similar in terms of security. So performance will obviously play a big role in this. Um, it will widely be measured on classical platforms. Uh, we put some guidance on that in our call for proposals. And it's one of the reasons that we'll likely need to standardize more than one algorithm. Um, Different application environments have different needs. You might need smaller key sizes or you might need faster verification for depending on what your application is. So we understand and, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we, we think there will be probably a few different solutions that we select for the standard in terms of a few signatures, a few encryptions or, or uh, chems and so forth. Our preliminary analysis upon looking at the schemes and the research over the past few years is that performance seems to be looking okay. Most of the schemes seem to be operating you know, as fast or if not faster or, or not that much slower than the current crypto that we use today. So that's probably not going to be a, a huge bottleneck. On the other hand, if you look at the key sizes of these algorithms, most of the submissions, um, if not all, have larger key sizes than some of the crypto systems that we use today. So that's something that we have to take into account and in looking at how we will use those in the future. Looking at, again, some more of the complexities. Um, so it's a, it's a hard thing to even just understand what is the classical security of a lot of these submissions, and that'll take several years to do. And then added on top of that, we need, we need everyone to be looking as well at what is the quantum security and what are the quantum attacks on these schemes. So. Um, that's going to take a lot of effort. And there's a lot of new situations which we've started to see and have been aware of that will factor into this whole process. For example, none of the, the current crypto we use today in our standards have decryption failures. So if Alice encrypts to Bob and she does everything right on her end and Bob decrypts correctly on his end, with some of the submissions there's still a chance that decryption will fail. It will usually happen with very small probability but if you're in some applications, if you're doing a lot of encryptions, that could end up being significant, and protocols will have to have a way to, to deal with that. So there's one example of something that we haven't had to work, worry about before. Uh, for hash-based schemes, there's also the issue of managing state, where, for example, if you sign um, more than one message with the same private key, it can lead to attacks and so forth, so you have to very carefully manage your state. and we have some stateless submissions in the, in the competition and we also have hash-based signatures that have um, state that are, I'll talk about them on another slide as well, but that's something different. Um, we have some ephemeral use cases where there's some schemes that you can't use static keys. It, it leads to some vulnerabilities or at least it makes them much more costly to, to have to pr provide workarounds. So there are issues with using only CPA security instead of CCA2 security. Um, and there's just new functions that we have to analyze. So before coming to NIST, I didn't understand that choosing random numbers is, 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 is as complicated a topic as it actually is. And now we have new distributions like for lattice algorithms, we need to follow a Gaussian distribution. And while it can be done, you know, implementers will have to learn something new and, and there could be possible mistakes that are made, so it's something that has to be carefully considered. So for intellectual property, um, I'm not a lawyer, so I want to make sure I don't say anything wrong, so I'll just quote what we had in our call for proposals. Um, NIST does not object in principle to algorithms or implementations which may require the use of a patent claim, where technical reasons justify this approach, but will consider any factors which could hinder adoption in the evaluation process. So basically, submitters were allowed to um, turn in submissions that did have patents. That was different than what was the case in the SHA-3 contest. Uh, submitters were supposed to declare known patents and at this workshop um, anyone who has not yet turned in their submissions uh, you can turn them into us at NIST, uh, me or any of the, the other people from NIST that are here so just a reminder to do that. 
Um, even though patents might exist for some of these, the statements that they, they sign are making these submissions and their implementations freely available for evaluation purposes and public review during this standardization effort. Uh, initially, this we hope this doesn't play a, a large role in the in the evaluation. In round one, we want all schemes to be based on um, the technical merits of their scheme. So we want people to to not worry about that at, at this point. So looking at the number of submissions that we did receive, uh, we had 37 preliminary submissions. We we had a first deadline where where teams could send in a submission and we would take a look at it and let them know if they were missing anything or they weren't meeting our requirements. And almost all of them then submitted to the final deadline and we had a total of 82 different total submissions that were turned in by the deadline. Uh, we did a quick review and 69 of those met all the requirements that we set forth and were accepted as officially complete and proper. Since then, five schemes have withdrawn. They acknowledged, uh, the submitters acknowledged the tax that successfully broke their scheme. So currently there are 64 that are, are still in the running. And we appreciate those submitters who acknowledged those attacks and, and did withdraw so that we could focus on the schemes that seemed to be more promising. Got a chart here that kind of summarizes uh, the different types of submissions that came in. It's a little bit subjective in terms of some schemes could be classified in, in more than one way depending how you look at it. But we did have 19 signature algorithms come in. Um, the majority of those were multivariate and lattice-based schemes. Uh, for chem and encryption schemes, we had a larger number. We had 45 different submissions. And the majority of those were lattice and code-based schemes. And I want to just uh, thank all the submitters. We know it takes a lot of work to prepare one of these submissions, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, implementation. And we, we really appreciate all the effort that you went to. Uh, we had a total of 278 submitters that were involved with the submissions in some way or another. 67 of those were involved uh, with more than one submission. And this vector here uh, kind of shows the distribution. So there was 212 submitters who were on one submission. There was 30 submitters who were on two submissions. All the way up to one submitter who was on eight different submissions. So I'll let you figure out who that was. Um, most of the submissions targeted uh, security levels 1, 3, and 5. That was a little bit easier to, to make your quantum security claims that way. There were 10 submissions that only focused on the, the lower security levels, uh, 1, 2, and 3, and they're, they're listed there. And there were 6 submissions that only targeted the higher security levels, 4 and 5. If you look at a map in terms of where the submissions came from, uh, they came from all over. We we're happy to see that all six continents except Antarctica had people who participated. There was 25 different countries from around the world and 16 U.S. states. So I'm, I'm going to put up a, a few different graphs that we compiled from the optimized implementations that um, were submitted with these submissions. And just a reminder, we don't expect performance to play a, a huge role in the initial part of, of the analysis. Performance is important, but we know that implementations take time to develop. And so um, we don't want to read too much into the, the, the graphs or anything like that. Um, these are coming from the optimized implementations that were turned in. And we know, again, that there's better implementations. So my purpose in putting this up is not to look at the performance of any particular scheme, but just to tr kind of look at general patterns and trends that we can see. And for things like looking at key size, you know, we can certainly see that from um, the implementations. So this first one here shows some CAM and encryption schemes that were targeted to be uh, the first security level. So the lattices are the orange dots and the codes are the blue. And this is a public key size by cipher detect size. So you can see there's a relationship between the two there. And for the most part, what I, what I take from this one is if you look at the key size, um, the, we're looking at several hundred bytes, which again is bigger than we, uh, the current crypto we are using. And some of the key sizes you can see go up to be very, very large. Um, here's one that involves CAM and encryption schemes at the third security level and this is looking a little bit about performance and so there's a there's a range on the the number of orders of magnitude that you can see going on and it's a little bit interesting here to see that 
The lattices being in orange seem to all be below the, the blue in code. So from that, it looks like in general, lattices seem to have a little bit faster decryption time than codes um, is, a, is a possible trend that we might see. Um, looking at performance by size. So here's another example of a graph where you can see that performance is mixed among lattices and codes and other schemes. So you won't be able to judge a submission just entirely based on knowing it's a lattice scheme or it's a code-based scheme. We'll, we'll have to actually see how everything works out. For digital signatures, so we've got uh, lattice-based schemes in orange and hash and symmetric in blue and gray is multivariate. So there's a wide range again in terms of looking at key gen time and signing time and the algorithms are, are somewhat still scattered. If we look at public key size versus signature size, you can start to see a little bit of the separation that occurs. So for example, multivariate schemes, it appears, tend to have larger public keys and a smaller signature, smaller signature size, whereas like the hash and symmetric, smaller public keys but larger signature size and lattices are, are somehow in the middle of those two. But again, the, the schemes are also all kind of mixed together so that you will be able to you have to look at each particular scheme in the future as we get better performance numbers and is we know there's going to be a lot of third party analysis and we appreciate that of people uh, creating benchmarks and so forth to look at all of this. So we've had a lot of good discussion and questions over the past few years. Um, we created a PQC forum where people could participate in this and ask questions and give comments and feedback. Um, currently, I think the forum has around a thousand different members that are following it, um, some obviously more active than others. And just wanted to summarize some of the main kind of topics that have been discussed. So around the time of the call for proposals, there was a lot more questions in terms of we were trying to figure out the API and there was a lot of issues in figuring that out. So figuring out, uh, setting that up and what third party libraries people could use and, and how to handle that. Um, some of the, the other major topics that have, have been discussed in the past and are still being discussed in terms of uh, quantum security versus classical security strength, that, that comes up again and again. Um, the different security notions, how to generate random numbers, uh, key exchange versus key encapsulation, um, a lot of implementation details. And more recently, we've had more official comments on submissions, and that's a way to provide a comment that's geared specifically to a uh, uh, one submission where we can more easily track that. Uh, people have also discussed IP uh, issues as well. And the, what, the topics that seem to come up the most we put on our FAQ page so you can find those a little bit easier. But the uh, form is now it's publicly available. I don't even think you have to be a member to see it and the archive is also there and you can search it easily so you can you can put in the search terms you want and, and find any uh, posts about whatever you're looking for. So the official comments um, on our webpage where we list all the submissions, we also have a link besides each one for where you can submit an official comment on that algorithm as well as you can also view the official comments on that algorithm. And we have a pretty quick turnaround. If you submit an official comment, usually within a day or so it, it shows up there. You can also just post to the form and put official comment in your uh, subject line. And we found this to be very, very useful. And it makes it easier to, to, if you're looking at a particular scheme and you want to see what's been discussed about it, you can then just go right to there. And comments, they range. They can be very minor. It could be just saying, oh, there's a typo, or there's a bug fix that we need to do. Or some are more major, where they've completely broken a crypto system. Um, so we're finding them very, very helpful. 38 submissions so far have official comments so far. Uh, 26 have yet to receive any official comment. Of the 38 that have received comments, uh, 18 have two or less. So the number of, of comments that it's received in and of itself doesn't tell you anything because the comments could all be minor or they could just be one comment, but it's a complete break. But it, it's still, there's, there's a number of schemes that we haven't received comments for. So we hope people are doing evaluation and analysis, and maybe it just means there's nothing yet to say, there's been no attacks found, but please do continue to uh, use the official comments. Overall, there's been a little over uh, 200 so far, and more than half of them are actually just focused on 10 different submissions, so uh, continue to provide those to us. Um, Transition and migration, we know that there will need to be a transition in the future. It will not be a, a pain-free transition. 
NIST will up update our guidance and other relevant standards documents that we have as post-quantum, as our standard becomes available and as we have more guidance. A lot of people have expressed interest, uh, interest in a hybrid mode and that's a way of combining a, a classical scheme like ECC or RSA with the post-quantum scheme in such a way that you're kind of hedging your bets because to break the hybrid scheme you have to break both the classical scheme and the post-quantum scheme. We yeah. think that seems like a very sensible uh, idea to consider for migrating um, and this can be done in a way that you can still get FIPS 140 validation if you do it correctly. The validation will only be talking about the classical part of the uh, NIST approved algorithms since we don't have yet a post-quantum standard. Uh, we're also considering uh, standardizing stateful hash-based signature schemes early. Uh, stateful hash-based schemes were kind of out of scope for the, the call for proposals. They wouldn't fit the API that we had. Um, and for the most part, we're, we're actually just waiting for the IETF and the CFRG to, to finish what they've got going on. They're, they're looking at some hash-based schemes and we'll likely standardize whatever they end up doing. Um, it'll only be for specific applications like digital code signing. Um, but we, do, we would like to hear back more from industry and implementers on the urgency and, and the impact of hash-based signatures. We're also working with other standards, standards organizations and other groups around the world. Um, we know that it takes a lot of work and, and there are other people working on this as well. Uh, IEEE P1363, they were one of the early standards groups that had some lattice based schemes that were standardized. Uh, the IETF is working on stateful hash based signatures right now. We've been uh, in communication with them and, and talking with them very closely. They've expressed interest in looking at other post-quantum algorithms, but it seems to me uh, from reading the messages that they're, they're deferring to us and waiting to see what happens with this post-quantum uh, standardization effort. ETSI, the European Telecommunication Standard Institute, has been very active. Uh, they've been holding workshops, and uh, they call them Quantum Safe Crypto, and they released a number of very helpful reports as well that are providing guidance to industry and we're working closely with them. We've given presentations, we've participated in the reports. Uh, they'll have a workshop later this year in, uh, in November in China. There's other expert groups like PQ Crypto and Safe Crypto that have been providing research and providing recommendations and, and a lot of them are involved with the submissions that have been made. So that's, that's been helpful. ISO has been working on post-quantum for uh, a couple years and my supervisor Lily, Lily Chen is, is heavily involved with that and they're currently developing a standards document. So we're working with these groups and we want to make it a very collaborative effort as, as we move forward. So what's next? Well, uh, this is our first workshop and over the next couple days you'll get to hear a lot about all the different submissions. We apologize again that the, the time for each talk is so short, but that's just the reality of having a, a large number of submissions. So we'll have a, our second workshop in a, a little over a year. It'll be in uh, California in August most likely. And sometime between now and then, as I said, we're going to cut down the, the 64 submissions or however many are still in to a smaller number. We're not exactly sure what that number will be. We'll, we'll announce it when we get to that point. Um, but we want, what we're looking to do again is to create a standard as soon as we can and have re, uh, a good amount of confidence in the security so that we have post-quantum crypto algorithms ready to go in a standard. So we're going to be selecting the schemes that are most promising for that goal. And those schemes that will be moving forward in the second round will be able to make some minor tweaks. We don't want to have any big substantial redesigns. Um, and we'll, we'll announce that of course and let everyone know. But there's, there's two different things that can happen if you're a, a scheme that isn't selected to move on in that second round. You might be eliminated from the standardization process if we feel that we don't have enough confidence in the security to standardize you. So we might have a list of algorithms that say, okay, these are algorithms that we're not considering anymore. Uh, the other thing that could happen is you don't move on in the second round, but we also don't eliminate you. So you're kind of in, in some type of limbo where we might uh, be able to consider you for the future but not for this initial standard document that we're working on. So that's kind of the way we're envisioning the process and, and that we expect that to uh, happen.
what does NIST want from you? Well, just continue doing the work that you're already doing. You're doing a great job. You're doing a lot of research, um, a lot of implementations and so forth. So just continue to publish and present the work that you're doing and make those results known. Uh, communicate it on the, on the forum so everybody can see that, make official comments so that we can keep track of it. Uh, we encourage you to do implementations, benchmarks, compare these algorithms on a wide variety of platforms. Uh, that's something we don't have a, a large expertise at NIST at, so we, we very much appreciate other people working in that. Um, we also hope people will really start looking into the, the details of how these will be put into protocols and in, in applications. We don't want people to wait until we have a standard and then start looking at this. That'll just add time onto the whole issue of, of getting these, these things deployed. And with some of the estimates for quantum computers being 10 to 15 years, the, the quicker we can get that done, the better it will be. Uh, if you have any comments that you want to send to NIST directly as well, um, we're, we're happy to talk with you and there's the email address. We have